So, as a candy company, if you're trying to make a uh, green apple Jolly Rancher, so you want to make it taste like green apples, you figure out what chemoreceptors are being bound to in the nose, find something that can duplicate that, and there you go, it's going to taste like green apple. Even though it has nothing to do with it, kind of like Even though it has nothing banana to do. Laffy Taffy. <coughs> yeah, there's no banana in it, but they're able to like duplicate the sensation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's kind of messed up. <laughs> so would it, um, what if someone, could it be possible that someone not taste the same? With, if they had a bad nose, yes. You like guys are going to do... Taste like banana or... Yeah, so whatever. that is possible. The for sure. Like your guys are going to do a lab where you squeeze your nose as a drink juice and you're going to guess what type of juice it is and you guys will be like, oh, do yeah. I not know this? But you can still tell if it, like you can't taste what it is, but you can tell that it's still bitter or yeah, you can tell it's still it, sour. You, you'll be able to put it in your mouth and be like, this is definitely a juice. It's sweet. Like mm -hmm. it's definitely, and it, it will be weird to you because the second you unplug your nose, all of a sudden like it's, you, the taste will come in and you'll be like, whoa, that's medicine. Like, so, like, for example, I did one. I still gag because I can tell that it has yeah. a nasty taste. Mm -hmm. I can taste it, yep. but... Yep, exactly. Yeah. Like, I remember doing it and going, okay, that that's apple juice, I guess. And then I unplug my nose and go, no, nope, that's great. That was great. <laughs> that's you so know, weird. It's, it is really weird. I wish we did that before the test. So. I know. So if you have, like, really good nose abilities... So if you have a really good palate and technically you have a really good nose... Is that no. what it is? Okay. Because the, your mouth can only, you know, tell the difference between five things. Your nose is then able, because your mouth and your nose are directly connected. Yeah. Like in the back of your throat or whatever. And then also, Because like, I'm able to do that. Like, I'll taste something, and it has, like, tons of ingredients, and I'll be able to tell you. It's because you have like, a really good nose. And then if I smell something, I'll also be able yeah, to tell you. Yeah, exactly. Like you have a really good nose. Okay. So when you have a good palate, it's really... I have a good palate! Your nose <laughs> It's is. not good so when you're pregnant. So the smells go oh, yeah, up to the mucous I, membrane. What so they go, it's, they go into the nose, go in, and dissolve in the mucous membrane. They then attach those nerve endings or chemoreceptors, which then sends an action potential to the brain. Okay. Ear, I know. It's... That's a great ear. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the pinna, the outside part. So sound wave travels in. It hits the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane, imagine like the top of a snare drum. You know how it vibrates when you hit it? That's what a tympanic membrane does. It vibrates when the sound waves hit it. Now there's the three bones. Here, I'll erase this for a second. There's the three bones. There's the malus, incus, and stapes. Can't remember the order, just remember miss. Mm. Malus incus stapes. Wait, so the tympanic membrane hits the bone, right? Yeah, the malus, the, the malus is connected to the tympanic membrane. Okay. So okay. it's sending that vibration through the three bones. This is a really complicated drawing of an ear. <laughs> I'm trying to copy it. It's okay. It's as simple you're as right. I think I can make it. <laughs> so, it it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, so it <laughs> travels down through the malus incus stapes. The stapes is the one that's shaped like a staple. That's how I remember mm -hmm. it. It covers the oval window. And it actually, with the vibrations, it hits the oval window. Oh. So it's just hitting that oval window, which sends vibrations through there. Now I'm gonna take the cochlea, and I'm gonna unravel it, because it's shaped like a snail shell. I'm gonna unravel it for a second. So this is our, our cochlea unraveled. Oh, we just talked about this. I actually remember talking about this in class. I'm really impressed with myself. I don't remember. Okay. So, that, that state piece is hitting the oval window, saying vibrations. It sends that vibrations through the cochlear fluid that makes waves, like an ocean. I watched that cool video. Yeah. Literally waves. Those waves hit different hair cells, and when they hit a hair cell, they bend it, and that bending of a hair cell sends an actual potential to the brain. And that's what we interpret as sound. Higher pitch sounds are closer to the front of the cochlea. Lower pitch are closer to the middle. So when you guys hear a high pitch sound, it's the waves are hitting higher up in the cochlea or those closer up. If you're hearing a lower pitch, it's farther back that it's hitting. Now, the first hearing to go is your high pitch hearing because it being closer up, that's what's being hit the most, those hair cells. Mm -hmm. 
when you guys go to a really loud concert and afterwards your ears are ringing for a couple hours, it's because those hair cells get bent so much that they stay bent for a while. And when, as long as they're bent, they're sending extra potential to the brain. So it's sending extra potential to the brain that you're hearing sound, even though you're not. Luckily, after a couple hours, they come back up. But you can lose your hearing by too many loud noises, which I'm sure you've heard of that case, like people say, if you listen to music. It's the actual, like, sudden exposure to loud noise can cause all those hair cells to be bent and never come back up. And if they don't come back up, you can't hear. If it's gradual, then it's okay? If it's gradual, it, it, they found that it's, it's not the aspect of hearing loud noises, it's the aspect of quiet to loud. So, okay, yeah. just like the shock. Because, the yeah, the waves all of a sudden are smashing into these okay. hair cells. And, okay. yeah. So the stapes? Stapes. Stapes hits the oval window. Yes. And that sends vibrations into the cochlea? Yeah, the, that, that cochlear fluid right here. Cochlear fluid. That hits <laughs> the different uh, hair cells. That sends action potential to the brain. Now the last step, there's this little round window at the base of the cochlea. I'm sure you guys saw it when you're looking at it, one identification. This wave, the fluid doesn't leave, but the wave does. And that's important. Why? Because if it didn't, it was just the wave would just keep traveling back and forth, and all of a sudden you're hearing sound over and over and over again. That would be terrible. And so you want that, that sound wave to actually leave. And so through the auditorial tube. It can leave through the auditory <laughs> tube. Auditory tube, so that, yeah, the, it comes out the round window. Auditory tube's right there. Yeah. That's what keeps the air pressure inside your ear the same as outside. I thought this oh, right. is where the sound wave leaves. We just talked about that, I thought. We were talking about air pressure when we were oh. talking about that. Oh. Uh, I don't know where it went. Oops. <laughs> oh, well. I'll find it later. Um, but the auditory tube, when you yawn, like when you're going up mountains and it feels like oh, you need to yeah. pop your ears, when you yawn, that's what you're doing. Is you're opening that auditory tube up to the back of your throat, and so that's allowing the air pressure to okay, even so out. So how does it leave? Mm -hmm. Sound wave, sound waves, waves can travel through a lot of stuff. Like waves traveling through the table. Mm 